good afternoon everybody welcome to uh, the first uh, external speaker of the civil seminar series so um, i'm very pleased to introduce mr rod case uh, one of uh, civil engineering graduates who has developed a very strong career uh, so uh, rod was raised in uh, ingerson in Ontario, and then he graduated from UWO in civil engineering in 1992. We just had a quick shot, just four years before I joined Western. And then he completed his Master of Science in Supply, and supply Chain and Logistics at uh, Cranfield University at the UK. And then he worked <coughs> in rail <coughs> for his entire career. Uh, started at Canadian Pacific in British Columbia, and he worked there for 17 years. And then he worked in Paris, France for two years as executive head of rail freight planning. And then 14 years at Oliver Wayman uh, as partner and global leader in, lay, in rail. Uh, he worked in 21 countries while being at Oliver Wayman. That's quite impressive. And currently, he resides in Western Ontario. Okay, so please welcome with me, Mr. Case. And I will let you listen to, I'm sure, a very interesting and informative presentation. Okay. Um, first off, um, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's funny, you know, um, it was a long time ago I graduated from Western. And uh, my son going back, brought back all the memories. And uh, because of that, I got in contact with Virginia and, and got deeper and deeper into the faculty. So being back at Western in this role is, is a lot of fun, honestly. Um, and now that I'm living back in Ontario, it's actually easy to get to see you guys once we get past this COVID thing. So um, uh, Reza, do I just go on my screen? Is that how this is gonna work? Yes, please. Yes, you can share the screen. Okay, do you need me to share it again? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. We're almost there. Okay, so you guys are looking at an intro page? Great. So, um, apologies to, <laughs> to those who might find uh, railroads not all that interesting, but it's been my career. Uh, it was frankly the reason I went to uh, engineering and um, what uh, I've ended up in doing as you've heard is I, I tend to do railroad work across the world mostly for freight railroads. Um, I do it out of Windsor, Ontario so up until COVID I was on an airplane a lot and what I'm going to do um, is just kind of take you through a quick introduction of where rail is now um, some of you, you're going to go, oh, that doesn't surprise me. And others are going to go, geez, it's got more going on than I knew. So I intend to kind of clip through about 20 slides um, at a reasonable pace so that we can do any questions and answers at the end. Um, sometimes that tends to be a little more interesting than just a canned presentation. But I thought probably because of um, the nature of the school and, and all the things you're doing at Western, I take you through kind of the things that are moving rail and how technology is playing in it um, so that you understand where we're going. So first and foremost, um, let's get a baseline. So it depends how you look at the rail industry. Um, you kind of have different views. The railroad view is the middle one, which is basically railroads move half of everything. And uh, because of that, they're kind of a stealth industry. A lot of people don't um, think about them unless they're blocking Richmond Street as you're trying to get down to the pubs or the bars. On that, you really don't think about it. Um, but it does move about half of the tonnage in North America. And um, that's how the railroads view it. Um, the suppliers uh, tend to take a different view. They tend to say, well, rail's only 10% 10, 10 of all the revenue that is spent on service transportation. So it's not all that interesting. So often it's hard to get big tech firms interested in us or, or big suppliers. You end up with General Electric and others who kind of own the market. But the, what's important is the tech firm view is they, they don't even know the rail exists uh, because they think in vehicle miles. So, you know, 
rail, even though it has 36 billion vehicle miles, uh, barely gets 1%. You know, it's, um, it's uninteresting for most of the people in Palo Alto um, and all those other great places. So part of the challenge for rail is trying to figure out what's going to happen in passenger cars um, and vehicles and how do we translate some of the technology into rail because generally speaking, the tech people aren't going to spend that much attention to us. Um, but it's critical that we get that difference. So let me take you in a little deeper. So what, what is going on in, in transportation? And this again may be a chart that some of you have seen before, but basically um, the whole surface transportation business in North America is massive. Um, and rail is only 72 billion of the total package. And that's our gross revenues. Um, we are the most profitable part of transportation. Our margin, our average margin in the industry right now is about um, 40%. So we make 40 cents off every dollar revenue. Um, we only spend 60 cents. That compares to trucking at about 92 and aviation pre-COVID of about 94. So um, rail is wildly profitable compared to all the other industries that do transportation unless of course you're Amazon. And that's what's got us focused is the cost of carrying inventory um, around trucking and rail is beginning to dominate. Because you can see there, the carrying costs are $400 billion. Um, and that's a big number. And with rail, there's a lot of carrying costs because we move a lot of stuff that doesn't move very fast, like cement or grain or, or containers. So because of that, we're finding that the logistics world has become very important to us. And frankly, rail service um, often isn't at the standard that an Amazon or others will use because rail is too inconsistent. Um, so anyway, let me just um, go to the next one right there. So here's the rub that everyone always wants to talk about. It's like, oh my God, there's gonna be driverless trucks and we're all gonna die. Um, that's the rail industry response. and, and driverless trucks are going to be really bad, but um, they are not the main problem at the rail. The main problem for rail competition right now is trucks are advancing on energy in a very substantial way. So they're becoming much more energy efficient just in the burning of diesel, um, but they also are becoming much more energy efficient as they convert to other alternative fuels like fuel cells, hydrogen, natural gas, whatever. ADAS is the safety systems. Um, you may or may not know that increasingly trucks are carrying the kind of safety systems you'd expect in your Tesla. I own a Tesla, just for what it's worth. Um, and they're keeping the trucks on the road and they're hitting people less and they're causing less accidents. That whole world is really important because basically all those devices are eating away at the job of the driver. Um, and the more safe those devices become, the less the drivers can be allowed to do. So that's really important because driverless trucks are not the, uh, the goal, they're the end game. Um, the goal is to automate the truck as much as you can for safety, because safety pays, um, pays huge. Um, the next thing that's happening is increasingly they're looking on how to connect three trucks or more um, into effectively a train on the interstates so that you they platoon them and of course that becomes really important because it saves a lot of uh, fuel because they draft on each other and then eventually on the second stage you get down to one driver so um that whole situation is kind of what's got rail concerned the driverless truck is not as scary because it's really complicated but the first steps are not complicated and they're happening now um, trucking is much more competitive um, and if Elon Musk has his way, it'll be even more competitive with his electric trucks. So rail's in a position that it's watching truck costs go down 40%. And if it doesn't respond, it will lose the market. So what is rail doing? Just one second. I, oh, there we go. We stopped. Okay. So rail's kind of an interesting situation, right? Because it's fully integrated. We own our infrastructure, we own our control systems, we own our safety systems, we own all our terminals. So it's not like uh, any other transportation business, like an airline who has to get permission to land. Um, we own it all. By the same token, um, we have very few assets relative to the rest of the world. So there are 1.4 million tractors to pull uh, trucks around and about 9,000 9, locomotives do all the work. So our, our conversion rate 
is much easier to do in the sense that it, um, can, it's a much smaller population. The bigger problem is um, we share our assets across all of the railroads. So there are seven major railroads in North America and there's 200 small railroads. So a locomotive that starts in Montreal could find its way all the way to Mexico City and back. So the technology platform has to be important. So that's why the first thing, tighter integration, um, is the first big thing. And that's all tech around data systems and control systems and um, your overall design of the plan. The more integration we get, the more we're going to knock out. And the second big thing we're working on is reducing the amount of time that trains break down. Um, and trains break down, frankly, quite reasonably in the sense that um, you'll have, and I don't mean derailments, I mean they have a mechanical problem online. You, you have a train in Horn Payne, Northern Ontario in January and it's minus 40 and it's three miles long. Um, it's going to have problems with mechanical issues. And so we're getting better and better at that. But what's being debated right now is the conversion from a two person crew to a one person. And everyone would like to get to driverless trains. Um, that's, that's pretty obvious. We're on a guided you know, runway. It's pretty easy to go. We're really a one dimensional problem. You go forwards, you go backwards. You don't have other choices. Um, but that's a ways away. Um, there is technology and I'll get to that in the presentation that's gonna amaze you of what we're already doing. But what's really important, that hidden thing down there, the electric propulsion has gone from being a small thing to a really critical thing as the price of energy has dropped. We're gonna cover that. So basically the first two pieces are, we're working hard to get stuff to stop breaking down and squeeze out all the delay in trains. And that alone will keep us competitive with trucks. Getting rid of the driver, the locomotive engineer or, and conductor is important, but it's not nearly as important as some of the things you see coming up with automated dispatching. Um, if we don't get our rail costs down, we will lose market share and more trucks will end back out on the road. And um, as a Canadian, that should bother you because our dollar stays high by the amount of stuff we move to Vancouver by rail. So we'll get to that in a different conversation. So here, here's kind of the issue is um, this is the forecast by the US government of what's going to happen. And you can see that um, this is billions of ton miles. And they think compared to where we were in 2017, we'll effectively double the, billion, the number of ton miles operating in the US. And Canada's similar, actually a little bit higher. Um, and that's really big, right? That's, you know, double the trucks. Um, and rail, um, is actually going to lose market. And that's driven by some things that rail does um, that's problematic in the sense that uh, we, we're not good at short distances. Um, it's kind of the service that people will not put up with um, and stuff is moving more short distances. And then the second is, as we switch from a heavy in, industrial economy to more of a service economy, more of that volume is uh, your Amazon Prime orders. So rail is concerned about the drop um, we're, we're very wealthy in the sense we have a lot of money to spend on tech um, and we're trying to find how we hold our share um, that we had in 2017 as we go forward because about half is a good number for us. So that's a real challenge and what's on the side here, the general merchandise is the really critical stuff. It's the single car business. It's a car of chlorine, it's a car of oil, it's a, it's a car of lumber. All that stuff is true truck competitive. The, a lot of the stuff we do is, you know, big bulk services like grain or, or coal or stuff like that. But we really need to know that um, we can compete on that. And as you take a look at the chart, it says right now that basically we're not going to do a very good job. So the industry is swinging around with a lot of cash and a lot of technology I'm going to cover because this presentation was given to all the presidents of the railroads. Um, about four years ago, three and a half years ago, this, this part of the presentation, explaining that if they didn't change, they were going to lose their market. So that got lots of exciting things happening. I just got to go down. So what is the rail doing from a digital point of view to really make a difference? And um, first and foremost, energy is the number one cost for both trucking and rail. Um, labor comes second, but energy is number one. So energy costs totally, totally drive what's happening in both the transportation business and where we can buy stuff in the world. What's important um, that most of you, I'm sure, are aware of or be more aware of than I am, 
is the recent renewables um, sales. So large solar fields in Las, Las Vegas outside of LA, excuse me, the wind farms in Alberta are producing electricity for about two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, now that's the wholesale price, but the point is um, the chart on the left shows you the retail prices in America for energy. And then you see the two cents, which is the, the retail or the wholesale price. What's critical about this, and we'll get into a little more detail, is if I'm able to fill my train or my truck on the wholesale price, not the retail price, um, the entire competitive landscape changes. And the demand for electricity and renewable energy that you're seeing all over the place is now increasingly driven by transportation companies who are saying, we need to kick the diesel habit, not because it's saving the world, though there are those who say that. Um, the real issue is it's cheaper. And if it's cheaper, um, how do we get there fast? So the chart on the right um, is to tell you why it's cheaper. So this is the energy contained in the energy unit, in this case, diesel, versus the energy contained in a battery. And it says, when I turn that into tractive effort to move down the highway, of all the energy that's contained in that primary product, how much of it do I need to move the truck per mile? And not surprising, um, diesel exhausts much of its power out of the engine um, as heat and exhaust. So a lot of what diesel has is wasted, where the battery situation is substantially better. Um, and that's what has many people like Amazon spending, you know, $100 billion on electric trucks because this situation is compelling by itself in its economics. As batteries get cheaper, as they all are, um, you can see how that changes because the cost of a diesel truck is not changing a lot year over year, but the cost of a battery truck is dropping dramatically. Um, so what happens if we turn that into true energy costs? Um, it becomes even more interesting, right? So the 44 cents to 62 cents per mile is the cost of running on diesel bought retail and on average through the United States, kind of the low and the high. Um, the right side shows if you went and bought retail electricity at that 10 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour, um, and you can see the range there. And it's like, wow, that's like staggering, going from 62 cents a mile to 13 cents a mile. And that's the retail price. If I can get the wholesale price, it's a penny. Well, it's a penny and a half. But the point is almost free. Um, so this is pretty scary for railroads. It's also pretty motivating. Um, it has created our first battery locomotive that's being tested in Texas and California right now um, because the price of electricity, of course, in the sunny locations is pretty cheap. It's the two cents a kilowatt hour and an electric locomotive um, is what the rest of the world runs already. So a battery locomotive is pretty exciting. And um, that's what's changing rail. And that's what's motivating us because once you get to an electric locomotive, anything's possible with the tech. So just the last punch of this, just to give you a sense of how big this is going to be. Um, some of you will have read once there were things called steam locomotives. Um, they were dramatic, noisy, burn coal, were terrible. Um, and the conversion to diesel um, went from an 18% uh, efficiency factor to a 30%. And that wiped out the mechanical employees uh, from 438 down to 18. Right, that, that's the kind of dramatic drop you had because steam engines are really hard to maintain and diesel locomotives are not. Um, well, battery operated vehicles have no motor. Matter of fact, they have almost no moving parts. So there's almost zero maintenance. Um, so the question is, what's the future mechanic and mechanical maintenance responsibilities? There's a huge question that's come up, um, mostly being pushed by the Germans as they ch chase that. But the lithium battery running at 86% or thereabouts, um, you can see that its challenge to diesel is more dramatic than diesel was to steam. So this transformation is slow coming. You know, it took us 20 years to convert from steam to diesel. We don't expect we're gonna convert to electric tomorrow, uh, but by 2030, major parts of North America are gonna be under some form of electric operation and the end of the diesel locomotive. You know, to put the point, 
uh, Daimler and BMW have stopped all research and development on internal combustion engines. Uh, they stopped that last November, so almost a year ago. So people are pivoting and they're aiming towards making the electric device more powerful. And if you go back, that's good for rail because we have a few devices. We have eight, eight 9,000 locomotives to convert versus a million and a half trucks. The flip side is um, trucks are doing it faster. So if we don't get going, we're gonna be wiped out. So you guys may be surprised to find this out, but you know, a clever, oh, sorry about that. I gotta go back up. A clever couple of guys in Saskatchewan figured out if they put wheels on the bottom of a big truck, they could pull trains. And this became something called the Brant Road Railer. Um, and this is kind of the, the first gen of what we think a whole bunch of the small locomotive operations are gonna look like. Um, the fact that the locomotive is no longer beholden to a rail mechanic, but is actually gonna be fixed by a normal truck mechanic who can deal with an electric truck, um, we expect more of this. And these, these are very popular right now in rail service. Um, they do a lot of the local work, a lot of the maintenance work. So they've probably pushed out 2,000 locomotives already. There's 12,000 locomotives um, that operate in the local service areas that are small and they're less powerful. And these kind of conversions can be important. So what's important here is um, how goes truck technology is probably how rail is going to go. And if rail can do that, it will leapfrog um, because all those four axle locomotives, the last one was built in 1986, and the first one was built in 1955. So they're older than me, um, definitely older than all of you. Um, so the fact that they're so old is literally going from owning, you know, your uh, pager, which none of you will even know what a pager is, um, to your iPhone. And this is a huge opportunity for rail, but we think it's going to look like a truck. And then overseas, um, super exciting things are going on. Uh, God love the Europeans. Um, you know, we have this situation with the Alstom train where it actually recharges itself every time it stops in a station to pick up passengers. So it has no overhead wires. And um, as of a year ago, it was doing 18 million kilometers a year in daily operation. So it's not a beta test, it, it's actually a real test. And this technology has proven that you don't have to string wires everywhere uh, because that's like super expensive and um, it gets in the way of people that tend to touch them. And there's all sorts of interesting ways to recharging the batteries, but it recharges in about 20 seconds, um, enough to get down a couple more kilometers before the next station. So this has become extremely popular. Um, and there's technologies like this looking at coming to North America. This would be very handy at local switching locomotives. And then the next is this full charge battery um, does the same thing. It recharges in intermediate stations, but at the end it needs 10 minutes. So you have both models that are different energy storage systems, but they're both um, different competitors and going after it. And then most importantly, for any of you recognize the picture on the right, that's Metrolinx in Toronto, so Go Transit. And they've issued an RFP for hydrogen fuel cells. So many of you may know, Canada leads the world in fuel cell technology. Uh, Toronto and Vancouver are the, the top two. Um, and Go Transit is of the view that they can avoid the about three and a half to four billion dollars to put up electric wires by using hydrogen fuel cells in a, a much more advanced train design. So they're trying to avoid the entire overhead, but by going into fuel cell. If they are successful, because still an if, if they are successful, that will see a massive conversion on the rail space because they have proved a fuel cell can actually move a train on daily service. And that will begin to topple the dominoes and end the use of fossil fuels in rail. So I talked about tech three times. So this is from a study out of Europe on our team in Europe. And what's really important is where is the money being spent? And to be blunt, everyone always wants to talk about the vehicle because that's like really cool, you know, driverless train or driverless car or truck or whatever. And um, the reality is, you know, one fifth of the money is now being spent on vehicles and uh, almost 80% of the money is being spent in data, data systems, data controls, data, all that, you know, more advanced maintenance systems. And 
you guys all know that because of what you're paying for your phones. Um, anyway, what's inside this that's critical as engineers is this is us. We are totally in the middle of all of this. This is us talking to the asset and talking back, having our infrastructure talk to the, the data systems to talk to the asset. Um, the, the engineering moment here is massive and it isn't about building a better train. It's actually about building a much better data system around the trains. And again, railroads are vertically integrated. So the power of that is now starting to come through as the road to making massive investments to catch up on technology. So again, the money is not in the asset. The money's in all the interconnectivity between the infrastructure and the asset and frankly, the cost customer. So what are we doing? Um, so we are running driverless trains. Well, they're self-driving at the moment. Um, this is something the industry doesn't talk a lot about um, because it gets people excited, uh, mostly the, the national negotiations that are on right now. But the reality is that um, over the past three years, we've been piloting technology that gets trains to drive themselves. Um, and that's a complex task. It, uh, you don't have to steer, that's for sure. Uh, but you, you gotta stop from running away. And what we have here is a situation that right now, as we speak today, there's about 500 of these trains running in the US. Um, and that situation with the train is really changing things. Um, it's making the railroads much safer. Um, trains are having less issues online. They're operating better. They're saving more fuel. Um, the crew issues, um, the human error issues are almost gone. And we just spent $20 billion building something called positive train control which is a, an advanced signal system that watches trains and stops them automatically if they violate any rule. So we, we have trains driving themselves and we have systems making sure they don't behave badly. Um, and that we are literally one step away from driver. Next, oh, just push the right button. Hold on guys. This one's really cool. Um, Full, full, uh, full uh, benefits to the guys who do this. Um, Canadian National, not only CN, but CN and the Australians have piloted the use of rapid photo imaging and big data to do analysis of trains as they pass. So CN's trains can go through at 60 miles an hour through these camera sheds. And the camera shed does everything on the train. Most importantly, it looks at the wheels and the bearings. Um, but it actually goes through and checks the entire body of the train, the loads, all those things. This all used to be done visually. There was a time there was one of my jobs to go out and visually inspect a train. Um, what's really impressive is this has sonic detectors. It has a different acoustic listening and it's infrared. So it's got a whole bunch of photo imaging. And we pass through these gates now. There's nine of them active in Canada now. And um, so a train from Toronto to Vancouver uh, one of those big container trains is going to pass through about six of these gates, which makes it by far the most monitored system in transportation. Um, as you can imagine, the, the sites talk to each other and says, hey, axle 431 looks weird. Watch it. I think the bearing is hot. And the next location grabs it again and checks it and feeds that all back. So basically, in this situation, automated inspections are taking what we call finders and making them fixers. So the directed repair of trains is going up. And because we share a million and a half railway cars between all the railroads, this is really important. So this is, this is huge and it's operating. And the other one uh, for the civil engineer and all of us, this railway car um, operates continuously in trains. So it's basically dragged around as a regular railway car. Inside, it's got about a million dollars worth of tech for lasers and everything to do a full inspection of the track. And it does, you know, the modulus of deflection, it does wear, uh, real, wear, God, I can't say it. The wear, wear, oh, I can't still say it. How much rail is wear worn? Um, the kind of flex we're getting in the track, it checks the right of way uh, for any shift or movement in the right of way. And these cars are operating continuously and they're each doing about 200,000 kilometers of inspection a year. Um, and what's happening, of course, the track failures are being reduced and the rail services are being improved. So just to give you an order of magnitude, when I started on the railroads um, back in the 90s, if you got 
700 to 800 million tons of freight over the rail before replacing it, that was good. Um, there's rail in Canada now with 2.2 billion tons of past traffic. Um, that's a testament to the civil engineers who have been behind these kind of technologies. So um, we're doing incredible things on the civil engineering side and this automated, automated and track inspection just takes us to the next level. So lastly, well, not quite lastly, but uh, for a different day and a different topic is groups like Amazon are starting to get interested in railroads. So this is Amazon's prototype for Europe um, where these trains will drive into city centers and release drones to take all your Amazon Prime deliveries back. Um, the reason they want that is penetration of city centers on high residential areas is easily done on rail. Um, we generally own all our own right away. We're grade protected. And um, by putting these drones in, they can run to a, a warehouse outside of the metropolitan area, reload and come back into the city and release more drones and collect them and go back. Um, so this is actually just a, an image, of course, but the patent is done. And there's a patent for a North American equivalent. So what's happening in rail with tech is things you might not have anticipated, but Amazon drone deliveries are totally uh, patented. So what's the implication um, for you guys? So um, kind of three things right off the hop. Globally, rail is spending about $500 billion a year on either repairing or building new infrastructure. Um, and that employs almost exclusively civil engineers. Um, so some of it's happening in Canada, some of it's happening abroad, but 500 billion is a big number. And we're also spending 500 billion on rolling stock, including the technology. So if you go back to the chart I talked about, of that 500 billion, about 150 billion is on hard assets. And then we're spending the other 350 on onboard systems, monitoring systems, data integration systems. Um, and we're bringing technologies very quickly, um, which is great. In Canada, um, going back to that, we move 60% of all the freight. It may come to shock you that there's more freight going across Richmond Street and through the VIA station than there is on the 401. Um, but the VIA, and, uh, the VIA line and the CP line are moving about 75 million tons of rail freight a year. Um, which is more than you move on the 401 and through London that is. Um, they have $17 billion in revenues um, and uh, about $6 billion of that is profit. So they're a good place to work because they got a lot of money. And um, between Toronto and Montreal, um, with GO Transit system and the Montreal REM system, they're dropping $20 billion into rail infrastructure, assets, stations, and, and rolling stock um, over the next five to six years. So um, Acon and all those guys have been collecting railroad engineers for a while. Um, there's one billion of brand new high-tech trains coming to uh, VIA. You guys may or may not know this, but um, they're German, um, which makes them sehr gut, sehr, sehr gut. Um, but they're really high-tech. I mean, we are literally going from a pencil sharpener to a writing tablet. I mean, it's that far difference in the technology that's coming. They're amazing trains. Um, the problem is no one's ever repaired a train like this. No one's ever maintained a train. So that's a whole new world for the mechanical guys. And then, of course, we're sitting on the edge of a $3 billion announcement to rebuild a railroad from Toronto to Montreal through Ottawa that would be our high-speed line eventually extended to London. So engineering's core what the railroads are doing, and it's core to our survival. So that's why I wanted to talk to you guys. So with this, um, I'll turn it over to questions and answers. The only thing I want to show you here, um, because this is just straight ego, um, I'm standing beside the world record uh, TGV in uh, Gare Lyon. I just had a lovely supper with a friend and we're out there and there's the high speed train. It got to 574 kilometers an hour. That in itself is awesome. What's really awesome is I got to ride it during the test and I got to 519 kilometers an hour. Um, I was the only Western grad, and I'm pretty sure the only Canadian engineer um, that got to ride the train during the sixth test. But I'll tell you, when you're flying along at 500 kilometers an hour on a train, it's amazing. Um, just don't want to derail. Anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to questions and uh, let, let you fire away. Anything's legal, so ask away. Thank you very much, uh, Rod. It was very fascinating, especially seeing all these new technologies going into the web. 
springs and uh, especially seeing that the battery and the green energy is now quite economical uh, there is not just the environmental motivation it's, uh, it's much cheaper too um i'm just going to ask a quick question myself before asking others the question so uh, now that uh, we see lots of uh, new opportunities what soft skills or overall skills do the students, grad or undergrad, do you think they, they, they require to be able to join this industry and be successful in that? So there's no question the industry is still a very practical industry in the sense that um, <laughs> you're not going to sit in an office. Um, you know, I cleaned up derailments in the middle of like the Canadian Shield as a young engineer. So it's still very tactile, very real. It's very visceral. The locomotives weigh 200 tons. Um, so you got to go to them. They don't come to you. So people who like being out in the field, people who like being involved in that, that's the industry is, rail is like 90% operations, 10% marketing. And um, so you've got to be interested. It's also a network base. So um, you got to have a, a love of traveling between locations and going to interesting places. Um, the differentiator now is um, really specifically that your your ability to adapt outside technologies to rail uses. Um, so that doesn't mean you got to be a wizard in like the latest big data tech. It just means you need to understand how to go to a heavy industry that's 150 years old and help them take technologies for a truck or for an airplane or for Amazon and how does it apply and those engineers who are doing that are really differentiating themselves. I tell you, the chief engineer um, for Canadian Pacific is only 36 or 37 years old, um, which makes him almost the youngest chief engineer on record, but he got there because he is high tech, but grounded. Um, he's a Canadian guy and he's amazing, uh, but he got that role and he's bringing in people because of that. He's bringing in like-minded people who are not gonna try and revolutionize rail, uh, but they're going to try to transform rail um, based on tech. So it's two things. You got to be pr very practical. You got to be willing to get your boots dirty. And then second of all, um, it's a network base. It starts in Halifax and ends in Vancouver. So you got to be able to move around. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Kind of. Uh, so we have uh, several questions. Um, Vinay asks, uh, what methods of analysis do you use when studying rail? So there's kind of three things. So my specialty is uh, network planning, hence the master's in logistics. Um, and my company produces software that does um, network planning. So for example, there was a time when I was responsible for blocking Richmond Street. Uh, <laughs> that was my, uh, or Adelaide, for any of you who got stuck by train switching at Adelaide. Our planning software figured out which trains had to work where and how they moved everything. So that one dimension is pretty strong. It integrates uh, labor, the assets, the capacities, the yard capacities, network capacities, port capacities, all of that's put into the model. And there's a number of sub optimizations and then a master optimization that then pulls together. And that has been the basis of the rail planning for about 10 to 15 years. And, is pro and well, about half of the work I've done around the world has been putting that in South Africa and Sweden and Kazakhstan and all these kind of interesting places. So that's one piece in terms of analyzing railroads. Um, that's building an efficient network. Then the other is really the asset classes. You know, how do you improve track? How do you improve locomotives? How do you improve cars? And each one of those has a discipline. Sometimes it's more mechanical, sometimes it's more civil, um, but there are people who live to make trains run better. And those kind of people have their own specialized tools and they tend to be fairly national. So there's a European set, there's a Russian set, um, there's a North American set, but at the end, there's conferences where they all bring it together. All right, excellent, thank you. A uh, question from uh, Asha. Uh, Canada has been very slow in high-speed train. When this will happen? <laughs> well, it depends what you mean on high speed. Um, so, you know, the magic of, um, the magic of high-speed trains is the fact that um, they go from a city center to a city center with high transit, right? And they, they do it in areas of three to 500 miles. So Canada's got basically one corridor that that would work in Toronto, Montreal, and to a lesser extent, London, um, and then even a lesser extent, Quebec City. 
that, that's where it's one. You know, TGVs in France work because one out of every five Frenchmen lives in Paris and they don't like the city, so they leave a lot. Um, so because of that, the TGV system works very well there. It's not nearly as good in Germany because people don't live in one city. They live all over the place. So it's more of a commuter system than a high-speed system, even though it's high-speed trains. So when you get to Canada, the economics are trying to run against that and get enough people out of Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal to get on the train to pay for it. Um, the current proposal, for what it's worth, is not funded mostly with government money. It's actually funded with private money. So about a billion of government money to get it going and two and a half billion of money like Casta de Poe and others um, going ahead. Just so you know, um, a different part of my life, um, I help large farms, large firms buy railroads. Um, and the, uh, the Ontario teachers pension owns the high speed line from the uh, Channel Tunnel to London, England, as an example. So they're also involved in this proposal. So there's a lot of private money coming into it. And just this past week, uh, private money got approval to build a high-speed line between uh, Dallas and Houston. So private money's gonna do it, government's gonna help, um, and then everyone's gotta get their ass on the train. So that's our challenge. We only have really one quarter that would work, but it's well-developed in the plans and the money is mostly private. So it's political, but if it goes, the money is not really government dependent. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Lemar. For the technology where train that would do the inspection of the train, uh, does the train need to be manufactured a certain way or does this machine inspect any types of trains? Yeah, um, any. The, the, the short answer is any. So there's one and a half million railway cars in North America. Um, there's probably 500 different body types. Um, on the running gear, there's probably 50 different variants of running gear, you know, wheel sizes, wheel treads, all those kind of things. So it's actually not that complex a problem. It is complex, but it's not that complex a problem. Um, it's looking for very specific things, uh, very specific wear points. And because of that, um, there are standards the whole industry uses against that. But it's not as simple as like Boeing and Airbus, which would be very easy. Um, it's not that easy. We have rail cars out there that were built in 1950 that are still operating. Uh, we have rail cars that are built last year in Hamilton that are operating. And the system recognizes that and it does all the photo imaging. And frankly, because we know what they are, over time we build a database that says, hey, there's that grain car again. Has it changed? And then we compare it against a previous sighting and uh, North America is beginning to share that information. So eventually there'll probably be about 400 of these sites in North America and the data will be shared amongst all of them. But yeah, it's not tough, but it's not easy. Excellent, thanks. Uh, from Mohammed, are bullet trains going to be available here one day? So pretty much, pr pretty close to the same answer as the other one. Um, just I'll take a moment. The trains that have been bought, the Siemens ones, are good for 200 kilometers an hour. Um, I think they're actually good for 250 on the right track. Um, a little bit of engineering um, for everyone to enjoy. Um, North American track is built based on freight trains and passenger trains sharing it. TGV lines, um, the, the high speed lines in France and, and uh, other locations like that, actually take the rail and they tip it in a little bit that pinches the wheel set so the, the wheel set rides in a different spot on the rail. And because that's why the train is so stable, because it's actually being pinched like a roller coaster the whole way. Where in North America, the rails guide the train. So the train tends to slide back and forth. For any of you who've tried to have your drink on VIA, you'd know what I mean as you leave Union Station. Um, so the technology standards are known. The, the standard of maintenance is about 30 times more expensive um, on capital long-term maintenance if you want to go 200 miles an hour. If you want to go 125 miles an hour, it's only about two to three times more expensive than the regular system. So that's what Canada's targeting. We can't afford the 200 because you're not going to pay the ticket price to get on the train, but you will pay a ticket price for 125. It's Toronto, Montreal, four hours, roughly. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, some, some questions might be a bit similar, so uh, feel free to give a very short answer. Uh, if you have already mentioned that. 
So how much civil engineers of various backgrounds are involved in the rail industry to be more specific in the operation stages, not planning or construction stages? Okay, so let me take an example. So um, in, our, in our rail system, there are, um, there are about 90, well, I don't kind of, there's about 100,000 miles of mainline track that has some form of signal control. Okay, in the middle of Saskatchewan, it's a 12 volt circuit that when the train sits on it, completes the circuit and the light bulb goes red. Not very advanced. Um, downtown Toronto at Union Station, we spent $600 million upgrading the signal control system there to automatically dispatch trains in and out of the city. So it, it's kind of lumpy, you know, place like Toronto, Montreal, Chicago, all those, all those things measure in hundreds of millions and have an army of um, signal engineers doing that. And then when you get out into the more rural areas, the systems get simpler um, and the control systems aren't nearly as advanced, a lot more GPS, a lot more radio now. Um, so to give you an idea at CP, at Canadian Pacific, the, the signal engineering expertise is probably 30 or 40 guys and women um, are the department. Below them are about a thousand technicians that are like there's two in London, there's one in Chatham, one in Windsor, um, one in Guelph Junction, you know, as they kind of maintain all the line side devices. So a few engineers, a lot of techs, um, and a lot of um, advanced kind of skilled people, but um, you'd have to have gone to a special college to do that tech stuff. The Fanshawe would work. You'd go to Fanshawe and get enough qualification to be a uh, signal tech. I uh, just want to throw out a, another question myself. So how susceptible is this industry to hazards, natural hazards, like uh, floods or hailstorms or other, other issues in Canada and worldwide? And do you okay. have any, any strategies to... Well, first of all, God hates railroads. Um, that, that was for sure. The best parts of my career were picking up trains and putting them back on the track. Um, so um, we have a number of things that are really tough on railroads. Um, the biggest one is the temperature swings. Um, you may or may not have ever thought about it, but the steel in the rail actually shrinks and expands quite a lot. Um, and in the winter, it shrinks and it snaps. Um, and that's fairly catastrophic, trying to pile up a train. And in the, win in the summer, um, the compression forces can reach you know, thousands of tons inside the rail and the rail will actually buckle in the sense of that it will jump left and right at the same time. And of course the train can't pass a track that's a giant S over, you know, 30 meters. So the train would derail on that. So we spent a lot of time um, dealing with temperature. And then when you get into more advanced locations and places like Northern Ontario, um, you guys enjoy this. There are parts of the railroad in Northern Ontario that are still sitting on mats of logs that were dropped in 1885. So you'll actually see during the summer, the train will actually go onto the log mat and you'll see the mat set as the train goes across and it'll climb back up on the rock. And in the winter it's frozen. So two very different kind of experiences then. And then out west with all the silt, the frost lenses are huge. That's a major, major problem in the railroad. We have to put on slow orders, meaning temporary speed restrictions, because the track has got out of alignment enough that we'd have to drop the trains down to 30 or 40 miles an hour until we can get out and uh, fix it by resurfacing the track or something because the frost lens is that large. So out west, the silt frost lenses are a real problem. But so short version, it's temperature um, is the biggest problem. The, the next one is just moisture. Um, there are some places where it, you get washed away. I, one of the best times as a civil engineer is the day uh, the uh, God hated Southern BC and we washed out 18 bridges. Um, I was building bridges for, you know, totally unqualified, it was lost. But I built bridges for like two months um, because we had lost the entire railroad, the entire coal operation in BC was gone with 18 locations, so. Great, thank you very much. Um, on Farhad, what is the main difference in infrastructures of the rail for high-speed trains and simple ones? Yeah, fairly close to explaining that before, but the, the short version is you can make a very, railroads are awesome um, to be built because the way they transfer the weight of the train 
is like a multiple bridge structure, right? So you got the train on wheel sets, wheel sets on rail, rail on ties. So the stress on the ground for a passing train is actually less than a vehicle on a highway, like a truck on a highway. So the, the track to Churchill North um, Manitoba exists because it can go across Muskeg that a road can't. So that part of rail is really good. I mean, that it's cheap and it, it gets to places like uh, Churchill, if you want to go to Churchill. Um, the flip side is it's not not very resilient. So to make it more resilient, the, the sleepers are, or the ties are concrete. The steel is premium, generally comes from Japan. It's got chromium in it. It's treated a special way. The fastenings are much more advanced. Um, so to give you a sense, we inspect um, with like all that technology before the railway car was built. The, the automated uh, train would pass every 20 million tons um, to do a full audit of the track. And on that, it was visual. Um, the TGV lines in France have that technology each night, just to give you an order of magnitude of the tolerances you have to manage. So in North America, I can have about 20 millimeters of width problems on the track and still stay at about 100 kilometers an hour. In France, I'm down to two millimeters uh, variance to maintain 200 miles an hour. So you just get the order of magnitude. You guys are all engineers, you know what it takes to deal with the, that stress cycling of a train every three minutes on the TGV lines, and you can't be out more than two millimeters each night. Um, you can imagine what that looks like in terms of the maintenance and the toys and everything you build to monitor it. Great, thank you. Uh, and our final question from Cody, do you foresee a new player entering the Canadian rail market? Or will CN and CP remain the big rail operators in Canada? Yeah, the barriers to entry are impossible, right? No one's going to build a new railroad. Um, at best, somebody's going to come buy the railroad. Um, so there's some concern that Amazon someday is going to wake up and just buy themselves a railroad um, because we have the best real estate everywhere. I mean, railroads, best thing going for them, aside from our steel wheel, steel well, a rail advantage where we use like 20% of the energy. Um, the next biggest is we have real estate measured in thousands of acres in really important places like downtown Toronto or downtown New Jersey. Um, so there's a real concern that Amazon's going to come and take us for our, our land, not our railroad, um, because they can get into the city on their own highways then. Um, that's the real concern. But in terms of anyone building another railroad, no. That said, um, a very ambitious group has got approval to build from Alberta to Alaska to Russia um, and that will be like a hundred and fifty billion dollar railroad and they got the latest approvals so I bet against them but if you like the wilderness you like grizzly bears I'll tell you man there's a railroad that's going to be built that'll take you a career to finish so that that's the biggest one going on in North America. Okay we look forward to riding on that train. <laughs> All right thank you very much Rock. It was very, very interesting talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, so this will be recorded and we'll post it for everybody to rewatch or watch later. Thanks again, Rod. And hope to have you again later on in the near future. Well, I've really enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's nice being back at Western, even virtually. So yeah, sure. thanks a lot, everyone. Hopefully Take next care. time we'll be in person. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> all right, thank you. Bye-bye.